Fox too, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, I think that uh, the the way that the media companies are traditionally organized, it doesn't necessarily lend itself uh, from a network perspective to thinking about international. But we're starting to do it uh, more and more, just as because we know that this content, a lot of times, has created ancillary around the brand, has value beyond just you know just the linear programming that we have on air. And so I think. I think more and more that we need to work on distribution arrangements for the exclusive content that's created that really supports the brand and actually gets economic terms in place that will incent that behavior uh, as opposed to a very siloed type of approach uh, in the past where, where it, you know, people, people do what they're intended to do, right? And I don't think that that's really been a focus uh, to date, but I think I do see that changing just even within the walls of Fox. In my space, how do you guys uh, salt? Well, you know, we, we're in over 25 countries um, beyond the U.S. And, and, and our approach has been a little different from other websites where we try and create localized versions rather than just take the same experience. Um, because, you know, the, the hottest uh, pop band on MySpace U.S. is likely not going to be the same here as Denmark. And we don't want to force necessarily, you know, the Western ways. We want them to feel like on MySpace Denmark, you know, their top celebrities or their top music artists are, are getting their due. So with, with the originals that we do that we have control over, you know, Sorority Forever was a partnership, so it, it's up to them. But if, if, if Sorority Forever was something that we had, you know, produced ourselves, the idea would be to try and create a Sorority Forever Denmark and a Sorority Forever Australia in those territories where it makes sense. And it's, it's not dissimilar from a lot of the things that, you know, Jared and Reality TV trying to take the format into different different territories, but really give each uh, region a localized version of that theme or that format and allow them to interact with those characters in the same way the U.S. audience has been allowed to interact with the uh, current Sorority Forever characters and just replicate <coughs> the, the kind of social entertainment uh, experience on those other sites. Look, building off of, of what Jason was just saying, it, you have to think about it if you're on the, the video side of things, we're just talking about that, breaking it down in between non-scripted and scripted programming. Um, and also depending on whether you're coming at it from a, a sort of a bottom-up creator model where I'm out to do my own new hip, cool show and I want to get it out there to the, to the world uh, broadly, you have to start thinking that why is it the fact just is the fact that top American dramas like Heroes, Lost, House are sold all over the world and in other countries those dramas work well but we don't see too many scripted, I'm sticking on the scripted side, scripted shows coming to the United States. If they do come here, The Office is a good example, they're completely reconverted for the domestic audience. The reason why they don't work internationally is not because they couldn't have a, a, a local show as popular in France or in Germany or the like, they're too expensive to produce for the local market. They just cost too much per hour and there are not enough TV viewers in Germany, France, Italy to justify it. So part of the, the benefit where you can see a much greater expressive capability here is because the lower cost of television programming or let's call it video programming online in scripted, you can now think about looking for properties around the world in local markets that may only serve those markets, but that can still be an intriguing part of a broader international play in scripted television. Non-scripted, because of the way that works, formats like you could have the biggest loser, Italy, the biggest loser, you know, Spain, the biggest loser, uh, Japan. It's, it's much more about tailoring it very closely to the local market. So what's nice about where we stand is that internationalization, which has not been traditionally possible in very expensive provinces of TV, including scripted, now there is the opportunity for someone to come in who has a leg on one side of the Atlantic or on the other and build much more of an international approach to television, which may surface genres or types of content that are very interesting to U.S. consumers and to international consumers that have never been able to get that type of content because it's traditionally just been this big pipe from America out.